Okay, so our topic for today is arrays. Um, I think we're going to be able to do this fairly quickly because arrays in C++ are pretty much the same as um, something like lists in Python. I know in Python, you also have um, tuples and dictionaries and uh, probably some other things that I'm not aware of. But um, the main difference in C++, I mean, I'll show you the syntax for doing essentially the same thing, but you're gonna find that arrays in C++ are much, much more primitive than the uh, types of structures that you used in Python. Um, and uh, I want you to know in advance that there are other structures you can use in C++ and we may touch on them later in the class that have more of the features that um, Python has with things like lists and tuples and dictionaries. Um, but right now we're studying arrays, which is just this super, super primitive structure doesn't have a lot of flexibility, doesn't have a lot of built-in functionality. Um, it's pretty much the programmer does everything. Um, so let's say that I want to create an array with um, a thousand, actually, let me just start small. Let's create an array with six items in it. Um, just like any other variable in C++, I'm gonna to have to declare that array before I can use it. So I'm gonna say int my array six. Okay. Um, sorry, time out just for a second. All right. Um, some comments about this statement. Um, this actually creates in memory a um, series of six memory locations that are going to be used to store values. So um, if I were to create a picture of that, it might look something like Two, three, four, five, six. Um, uh, all quarters. And then the indices the in would be numbered starting at zero. Okay, so if I say int my array with a six in the square brackets, I'm gonna end up with indexes zero through five. They always start at zero. And as with everything else in C++, we start off with garbage in them. Oops. Okay. So all of this, just from this one little statement here. Um, regarding this thing here in the square brackets, I could and almost always should actually make that a named constant. So I could say const int array size equals six and then use array, whoop, array size here instead of the six. But the thing in the square brackets must be a constant. So what that means is you can't write a program and try to figure out how big to make your array while the program is running, which may seem uh, really different from what you're used to in Python. Um, in Python, you don't even have to worry about how big the, the list is. I'll just use list as an example. Um, you know, you can just tell Python to add something to the end of the list and it just does it and you don't have to worry about what the capacity 
of the list is. In C++, I have to decide what the capacity or size of the array is going to be um, while I am writing the program. As it turns out, some compilers will actually let you put a variable there, but um, and, and some fairly common compilers. I, I can't remember off the top of my head if Visual Studio does that or if Xcode does that, but one of the two does. Um, so you just have to be careful to remember that that is not standard C++. You should not put a variable in there. If you do, uh, and then you try to compile your code on a different compiler, uh, it may not compile. Any questions so far? Okay. Really the only other thing, well, there's two more things I need to tell you. And then um, basically everything else we're gonna do is just practice, you know, do let's do a few examples using arrays. Um, and um, so the second thing I need to tell you is how to access elements of the array once um, you have declared the array. So I could say something like, my array sub four gets 19. And what that would mean in our picture is that this cell right here, which is my array sub four, is gonna end up with a 19 in there. Okay, any questions about that? And re really that's all there is to it. You, you, know, you can use that expression, my array sub four, any place where you would use any other variable, you could use it in a C out statement, you can use it in a C in statement, you could even use it as part of the index into the array again. So for example, um, actually let me, um, here's a, I, I'm gonna put four lines of code up here on this, uh, in my window. And I'm gonna give you one minute and I would like you to draw a picture of what the array is gonna look like in memory after I execute these four statements, okay? And ideally, um, this should be something that everyone, uh, I don't think this is any different from what you would do in Python. So hopefully this is just a little review um, other than the slight differences in syntax. Um, let me just show you one more thing first, just in case this makes it, uh, gives you some information that you need in order to do what I uh, just said you're gonna have to do. I'm gonna make my array a little bigger. What is this statement gonna do? Anyone wanna shout it out or put it in the chat? Is it gonna double the array size? Um, no, the reason for that is that we determine the array size here. And not only that, but once we've determined it, we're stuck with it. We cannot change it. We can, there's no way to double it or, or have it or anything like that. If that's what the size of that array is always gonna be until the program is done running. Um, but maybe more importantly, uh, we need to keep straight when we're declaring an array and when we are just using it at like it, like we would some other variable, right? So what we're doing here is we're just accessing the array. Um, so Drake is correct. The expression here in the square brackets is equal to 14, right? Two times seven is 14. So what we're saying there is my array sub 14 gets 43. Anybody 
confused about what's going on there? Let me, let me just throw out one more thing um, about the score brackets. And again, this has to do with just keeping straight whether you're working on a declaration or whether you're working on an actual statement. But the rule I said about only allowing constants in the square brackets only applies to the declaration. When you are accessing the array later after it has been declared, you can put any expression in there as long as it uh, evaluates to an integer. Anything else before I give you your little pop quiz? Okay, let's do this. Let's say, and I'm gonna just take this completely out of context of any program and just type it here. Um, I want you to draw a picture on a piece of paper. Obviously, I'm not ever gonna see it, but this is just for your own benefit. Um, Okay, I'm gonna just give you one minute and I would like you to draw a picture of what that array is gonna look like after those four statements are executed. All right, so um, I wanna ask a question. I guess I'm gonna ask you to do a thumbs up if you think that you know what the picture's gonna look like, if you feel I'm pretty confident. Do I get to see? I don't get to see thumbs going up. Either that or no one's putting them up. Uh, there are some going up, okay. Um, okay. So let's go through this step by step. I've actually already done the first two steps for you, right? right? Um, this is what the picture looks like when I just declare it except for the 19. And then the next statement, my erase of four gets 19, puts the 19 here. This statement here, the first thing I'm gonna to have to do is I'm gonna to have to do some calculations to figure out what the index is. What I have highlighted there is the index that we're going to be changing, right? So my erase of four is 19. 19 divided by five is three. So what I'm saying there is my array sub three gets one. All right, uh, give me a thumbs up if you got that far and got that correct. Six, seven, eight, nine. All right, good, that's, that's um, that looks pretty good. Uh, so let's do the next statement. Um, 
my array, so same thing on the next line, right? And first thing I'm gonna have to do is figure out what this index is. So my array sub three is one. So what this statement is saying is my array sub one gets 64. Okay, so this is what you should have in your little picture on your piece of paper um, if you uh, did it correctly. Any questions about those four lines of code? All right. Um, so we're almost done with everything I want to tell you about arrays that I think might be new compared to Python, um, which is pretty amazing when you think about it, right? The, the arrays are so simple that um, this, is, this is pretty much all there is for me to tell you. Um, but the, so the last thing that I want to talk about is how I'm going to use arrays if I need to pass them back and forth between functions. So how to use an array as a argument and how to use arrays as a parameter. So um, I'm going to start by just typing those three rules out so you can see them. I'm not sure if they will make total sense at first, but I'm going to just type them out and then we're going to see an example. So. First rule is oops. So um, hopefully everyone is clear on the difference between an argument and a parameter. But just to review, we call it an argument when we are calling the function. So maybe I should say when calling a function and let's say passing an array as an argument just put the name of the array okay in other words it's exactly the same rule as for any other variable right if when you want to pass a value when you want to pass a variable as an argument you just put the name of the variable same thing with an array so an example might be, um, we're gonna have a function called read numbers and we would just call it my array. Okay, that would be inside in domain. Okay, so that's if it's an argument. Um, when, defining a function and using an array as a parameter. Okay, so a parameter is what, what we call it when it's in the parentheses after the function name in the function definition. Um, declare, just like, and actually this is, this, again, the same rule as any other variable, right? Declare the array from scratch in the parentheses. Okay. Um, now there's a slight, that, that's only 99% true. Okay. But I really want to emphasize that 99% it's exactly the same as any other variable. There's one little exception. Uh, so if I was going to follow this rule, I would say int my array, array size, right? And then, oops, and then I would have um, the statements inside the function. Okay, so the difference I'm going to tell you about here is that you don't need that array, you don't need anything in the square brackets. And in fact, if you do put something in the square bracket, C++ just ignores it anyway. So to summarize, when you need to use an array as a parameter, you're gonna just put the declaration of the array there as you normally would put an array declaration. 
but you're going to leave the square brackets empty. Jeez. Any questions so far? All right, not too bad so far. Rule number three. Um, when you are passing an array, C++ always assumes that the parameter is passed by reference. Pretty strange. We'll see in a few weeks why this is the case. Don't want to go into a lot of detail now. For now, I just want you to know arrays are always automatically passed by reference, right? Um, this shouldn't be completely shocking to you because there's a lot of things in Python that are always automatically passed by reference, right? Um, so to say this one more way, never use ampersand on an array parameter. It wouldn't make sense because it's already passed by reference without the ampersand. All right. There's actually one more little detail related to that third rule, but I'm going to leave that until we actually get to the example. Any questions before we start working on an example? Okay. So I'm thinking that to simplify things, we're going to do an example and I'm just going to throw everything into main so that we can keep it simple and not have to worry about all of the parameter passing yet. And then after we've got that working, we're going to pull out some of those statements and uh, create functions out of them so we can then see the parameter passing. So um, I'm gonna write a program that simply reads numbers that the user enters. I'm gonna, it's gonna read non-negative integers the user is going to say that they are done entering numbers by entering a negative number. That should sound familiar. Um, and then we're going to just print those numbers out on the screen. Okay. Simplest possible application of an array that I could think of. Um, question before I do that, though, could we do that without arrays? Feel free to yell out or put something in the chat either way. Could we write a program that reads a bunch of numbers from the user, say a thousand, and then prints them back out again on the screen? Could we do that without using an array, with just using stuff that we've already learned in this class, regular, regular individual variables? No one wants to, oh, yes, yes. Anybody want to expand on that? How would we do that? Maybe a while loop. Okay. Uh, so if the user enters a thousand variables and we're going to read all of those numbers and then when we're done reading all of those numbers, we're, gonna, we're going to print them all back out on the screen. Um, how many variables would we need to have? At least a thousand, right? Right. We need to, we need to have a thousand variables and I don't think we could use a while loop, right? Because, uh, concatenate it using a string. I suppose that would work true. Um, that's a good point. It's, a, it's, a, it's sort of cheating because a string is actually just sort of just a, a type of an array. Um, 
So I'm going to have to add a caveat, I guess, to my question without using strings, <laughs> storing them as actual integers. Um, so the point is, yes, it might be possible, but it's absolutely not practical, right? Especially if I say, you know, okay, we want to make it so the user could enter 10,000 numbers or 20,000 or something. Um, that's not going to be practical. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that we essentially, that it's essentially impossible to do that. But with an array, it's very simple, okay? Um, so I guess my point there was just to sort of have a chance to distinguish between problems that can be solved uh, in a reasonable way without arrays and problems that cannot be solved in a reasonable way without arrays. So this is our first example of a problem that we cannot solve in a reasonable way without using an array. All right, so I'm gonna make my array size a thousand. Um, then I'm gonna have a loop to read in numbers from the user. This is gonna be a special value type loop. So see out. Enter, enter a number, negative number to quit. Seeing number. While number is greater than or equal to zero. This should look familiar from our study of loops, right? Um, what I wanna do is I wanna put this number I just read into the next position in the array. Problem is, I don't have any way of knowing what the next position in the array is at this point. So I'm gonna have to add another variable that keeps track of the, what position of the array I am on. So I'm gonna call that count because it's gonna be counting the number of times I have been through the while loop so the first time through the while loop, I want to put the number in my array sub zero. The second time through the while loop, I want to put the number in my array sub one, and so on. Okay, so there's putting it into the correct position in the array. Need to increment count, and then ask my question again. All right, any questions on that? I think that it, that loop is going to read numbers from the user, putting them into the, the sequential elements of the array until the user enters a negative number. Then I just need to print them out, right? So for print count gets zero, count less than what? I'm gonna leave that blank for a second. Oops. Uh, let's see, there was something that I, oh. I should say, okay, what goes here? Array size. What do you guys think? Does this have to be in the brackets? Um, array size? Yeah. Uh, no, I think what we're saying here is this is just the just an integer oh, that okay. 
count is going to be counting up to, right? So before we suggest any other ideas, let's talk about whether this idea is correct or not. Anybody have any problem with that? Well, let me ask this. If the user enters six numbers and then quits, how many numbers do we want to print? Six, right? Yes. It would always, the answer to Sean's question is yes, it would always go to a thousand. Um, so this is not gonna work because we're gonna end up with the six numbers that got entered by the user plus 994 junk values printed on the screen. Does that make sense to everyone? That's a pretty like, I almost just like wanna sit here until everyone understands that because that's pretty critical. Everyone get why this is not gonna work? Anybody want to admit that they're lost? Please, please explain that again. Sure. So this for loop is saying, so how many times is this for loop going to go? This for loop is going to go a thousand times, right? Because the array size is a thousand. And so it's going to print my array of zero, my array of one, my array of two, all the way up to my array of 999. So every time I run this program, this for loop is gonna print 1000 values on the screen. If the user only entered six values, then this for loop is gonna print those six values and then it's gonna print 994 junk values. That's not what we want. We just wanted to print the values that the user actually entered. Okay. Uh, Sean, yes. Uh, could you, can you hear me? Yes, barely. So could you use like, like change the variable of count for the while loop and then add that as the count? So if the while loop goes six times, then it would be six. Okay, so I think what you're saying is what we wanna put here is this count variable from here, right? Don't you have to change it to differentiate the two? Well, yeah, uh, if I just put count here, whoops then that wouldn't make any sense, right? So I would have to use different variable names for these two. Um, one way to do that would be to just say, uh, and so just I'm telling you in advance, this is um, probably not the best way, but probably what most new programmers uh, do. And that is, well, let me just think of the quickest way I can fix this problem. I'll put a Band-Aid on it. Uh, I need a different variable name. So let me use count two here. Okay, would that work? Yeah, but it's not like good programming language. Right, so yes, this would work, but I think we can do a better job of trying to write our code so that it's easy to understand what's going on, right? So what I'm gonna suggest is right here, I'm gonna say, all right, now that I have finished reading all of these numbers, I know how many items there are going to be in the array that are actually being used. We must count, right? So now down here, I can just say count again and use num items here. Okay. So I think we have a working program now. Um, let me just point out a difference between C++ and Python. And that is that in C++, there is no way for me to know num items other than just me, the programmer, keeping track of it, right? It's not like Python where I can put a bunch of numbers in a list and then I can use list.size or whatever it is uh, to find out how many items are in there. In C++, you have to keep track of that yourself. Um, 
And as I said before, there are other structures in C++ that we're not studying now where that's not true, but for now we are studying primitive, primitive arrays and with primitive arrays, there's no way to know how many items are in the array that are being used. And not only that, other than this constant, there's no way to find out how big the array itself is. Um, I want to talk about that a little more, but let me just let me just at least run this first so that you can uh, believe me that it actually works. Um, so I'm going to say G plus plus CPP, and then I'm going to enter some numbers: four, five, six, one, two, three. Enter a negative number because I want to quit. There's the numbers I entered. Okay. Um, no, oh, okay. So, sorry, it took me a while to remember what it was I wanted to talk about. Um, something interesting about how to approach arrays in C is that you're usually going to have two different concepts of size when you're working with arrays. You're gonna have the question of how big is the actual array? Or, or in other words, what is the capacity of the array? So in this program, the size of the array is 1000. But then you have this other question of how many of those elements are actually being used currently? And so that's what num items is down here, right? In Python, for the most part, you don't have to think about the capacity side of it at all. You just ignore that concept entirely. So in Python, you could have a list and you put four things on the list, in the list. And for all you know, the, the list as it's being stored in the computer's memory has a size of a thousand. You have no idea. You just know that there's four things in the list that you care about. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. In C++, you know exactly what's going on in memory. You know that the size of this array is a thousand. Kyle. So I'm kind of interested in how C++ doesn't do bound checking with arrays. Okay. So what I'm kind of like, my programming history says you want to pre-allocate the size. So like, you know, like sometimes I'll, I'll make an array full of zeros. So that way I've allocated in the memory this size of the array okay and uh the problem you run into in some of the programming languages is that let's say you want to make it larger then it will grab an entire new chunk of memory right. that is the new size okay. and trash the old one as it fills it in and i'm just kind of curious how c plus plus handles that when it doesn't actually bound check does it just grab the next memory location or does so it actually create a new one uh, good, great question. Um, so, um, the, I, I guess the, the, we're going to be talking about that a lot more as the course goes on, but in this, if we're just talking about primitive arrays and not bringing in anything else, the answer is it doesn't do bounds checking. And if the index of the array goes out of bounds, anything could happen. So, um, it might just crash your program the very first time you attempt to access something that's outside the bounds of the array, or it might uh, it might actually work and because where you know it just calculates where the thing is where the value is supposed to go and tries to put it there. And if it turns out to be a place in memory that isn't being used for any other purpose, then your program might actually work, which um, which is very kind of bad for the programmer, right? The programmer has to be super careful not to do that. Um, it's possible that you could write a program where, um, so in this particular case, let's say that I made the size of the array six, and then let's say that the user tried to enter eight numbers. That might actually work. It might actually work the first 10,000 times we run the program and there'd be no problem. And then the 10,000 and first time I run the program, it crashes. Um, so bottom line is 
programmer just has to be super careful. Um, the you're probably are you uh, a good thing to be wondering at this point would be why on earth would C plus plus allow that to happen um, and not check it? And the answer is one of the philosophies behind C plus plus is that we always want to allow the programmer to make things as efficient as possible, even if we're just talking about a billionth of a second. And if you incorporate range checking into your arrays, then that's using up CPU time. Every time you access the array, you have to do a, a range check. So, um, and this, I, maybe I'm going on too long here, but just to add one more thing to that, um, C++ does offer other structures that have features like range checking, um, which we will talk about a little bit later. Um, this is just what we're studying for now. So we're sort of starting with the raw primitive structure and then we'll move on from it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so that's actually, let, let's go. I'm just curious now. Let's go ahead and execute this and see what happens if I try to enter too many. And when I say curious, that doesn't mean <clears throat> I'm not sure what's supposed to happen. It means according to the C++ standard, the, what ha the behavior is undefined. Anything could happen. Uh, so I'll do one, two, three, four, five. Now I'm gonna try to put one in, the, in a position that has not been allocated. Didn't seem to have any problem. But then when I went to print them out, something went wrong and it crashed. <clears throat> okay, so I guess that was kind of a long conversation, but in case you're kind of getting a little lost, all you need to know from all of that is just be really careful that you never end up with uh, an index into your array that is out of the bounds of what you have, of the size you've declared the array to be. Um, now, I will also just throw out that, obviously, as you just saw, the program that I wrote right now is not well written, right? Because it does allow that to happen, and um, and you shouldn't allow that to happen. Um, if we have time, well, let me put it this way: in the lesson that I'm going through right now, that's basically like the next thing we're going to talk about is uh, let's fix our code so that. That's, we, we don't allow that to happen. But before I do that, um, I want to do what I said I was gonna do before, which is let's divide this up into functions and see how the parameter passing part works. So I'm gonna take these statements, including number and count, and I'm going to create a function named read numbers out of them. So I'm going to cut. Paste. There's my read numbers function. Obviously, I have some fixing I have to do, particularly with parameters and arguments, but I'm just getting the, the skeleton here for now. So up here, I'm going to have a call to read numbers. And then I'm going to have a function called print numbers. And these lines of code are the lines that are printing the numbers. So they go in here. Uh, and print numbers here. Okay, so I believe that at this point, we are all good to go, except we need to uh, fill in the arguments and parameters, right? So um, just like I did when we were studying parameters and arguments at first, I'm gonna take uh, one function at a time. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna work on the communication between main 
and read numbers. And the way I do that is I start with the call to function, read numbers, and I think, okay, what is read numbers gonna need access to? Well, read numbers is gonna need access to the array. And it's also going to have to report back the number of items. So those are gonna be my two parameters. So um, for the array parameter, I just type a new array declaration, except I leave the square brackets blank. And then I've got my num items parameter. Um, anybody see anything wrong with what I have here right now? That's correct. So um, here's the question. Looking at num items, which direction is that information going? Is that information something that main is sending to read numbers or is that information that read numbers is sending back up to main? The answer is read numbers is sending that information back up to main. So this needs to be passed by reference. Okay. And what about the array? Does the array need to be passed by reference? Yeah, it was kind of a trick question, right? If the question was, do I need to add an ampersand? The answer would be no, I do not need to add an ampersand because it's an array, so it's already passed by reference. So we're done. Any questions about that? All right, so let me just put the corresponding um, arguments up here in the calling function. That means I'm going to have to have a num items variable here. Um, okay, so I think we're done with read numbers. Let's look at print numbers. I'm going to, there's going to be something uh, interesting and new that's going to come up here in a minute with this parameter, but basically print numbers needs the same two things that uh, read numbers did. So I'm going to put my array declaration and my num items declaration. Okay. Any anybody have any issues with with this? Okay. Um, now I'm going to go back to the calling function and put in the arguments that correspond to those two parameters that I created and I think that may be it. I'm, I'm, I, there's enough going on here that I'm, I'm guessing that probably when I go to compile this, something's gonna complain. But um, as far as I can tell, I'm good. Let's just try it. Let me go ahead and put my prototypes up here. And if I try this, we definitely have a Oh, right. This, I don't want that to be a declaration because I already declared num items here. So I don't need to declare it again here. Let's try that again. Uh, four, five, six, one, two, three. Oh, that's, my, my array size is too small for that, isn't it? Oh, it worked. Yeah, see, there we go. That time it worked, even though it went out of bounds. So uh, moral of the story is just make sure that you're careful about, your, um, about going out of bounds. Everyone understand what I mean when I say out of bounds? I just, I just mean that I used an index here that 
was not allocated because when array size is six, that means I've got indexes from zero through five. So if I were to use a six or a seven or a 93 here in the square brackets, that would be out of bounds or out of the range. Um, okay, so we have a working program here. There's just one more thing I wanna mention as a matter of good practice, okay? And this is actually something that C++ is much more strict about than most other programming languages. Um, typically, uh, in, in fact, any programming language that I know of. Um, and that is that um, in C++, it's important that if a variable is not going to be changed inside the function or should not be changed inside the function, that we prevent it from being changed inside the function, just as a matter of sort of safe programming, okay? So the problem here is my array is passed by reference, right? Because it's an array and arrays are always automatically passed by reference, but we don't want it to be changed inside this function. But we have no way of making it pass by value. It's automatically just pass by reference. So here's what we do in C++. We say, we put the word const right there in front of the int. And that just means now that if I try to change my array inside this function, I will get a syntax error. The compiler will not let me do that, okay? So it's sort of a way of simulating pass by value, right? It doesn't do exactly the same thing, but it's just an alternate way of preventing the function from accidentally changing something that is not supposed to change. Any questions about that? So as you saw, it works without the const there. Um, although I could probably come up with an example to, that would break it, uh, maybe, not sure. Um, so, but that's not the main point. The main point is as a matter of good practice, you should put const there. Um, and I also need to change it in my prototype. Anybody wanna ask any questions about this code? I don't think I'll run it again because all I did was I just added the word const there. All right. Ready to move on then. Um, here's what's gonna happen now. Um, in this morning's class, I, I made a bad judgment call and I decided to skip ahead with about 15 minutes left in class and try to do a very complex example. And I ended up really like, really rushing it and still being over by about 10 minutes. So, um, I'm gonna do a simpler example. Um, if you want, so what I did and everything I did, I'm gonna do in both lectures is in the lessons anyway. So you can just go there and look at it. If you uh, wanna see what I did during the morning lecture, you could just go find the video on YouTube and um, watch the last 15 minutes. But um, we're gonna to try to do something a little simpler. <clears throat> um, okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna write a program that reads a bunch of numbers from the user and then prints them all back out again, but it omits the smallest number. Okay, so um, if, I were to, if I was running that program and I entered four, five, six, one, two, three, the output would be four, five, six, two, three. Any questions about what we're doing there? Okay, so <clears throat> we're gonna have exactly the same read numbers function. Um, so let me, but I wanna try to fix this now so that, it may, so that it avoids the possibility of entering too many numbers. And the way I'm gonna do that is I'm just gonna say, um, after I increment count, if 
count is equal to num items, that means that I do not want to ask this question again, right? Everyone understand that reasoning? If count is equal to num items, that means I have already put as many items in the array as I can, and it is now full. So I don't want to ask that question again. So I'm just going to throw an if statement in here. Did I say num items before? I think I might have I might have said that slightly wrong just a minute ago. Um, but hopefully this makes sense, right? Is if count is less than array size, then I'm fine, right? Just go ahead and get another number. But if that's not the case, if count is equal to array size or bigger, but I don't think we could, it could be bigger than, then uh, we want to stop. So I'm going to say, see out the array is now. Okay, and then the only other thing I need to do is here in the condition, I'm gonna say, keep going as long as number is greater than or equal to zero and also count is less than array size. Oops. All right, any questions about what I just did? So if array size is six, uh, the user enters the fifth number. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I put it in a race of four. I add one to count. So now count is five. That's still less than a race size. So I enter another number. I say, uh, um, so I go back up here. Count is still less than a race size. So I put that last number in the array. Now, when I say count plus plus, count is going to be equal to six. And so count is not less than array size. So I say the array is now full. Okay, so now I have fixed it so that um, I'm, I cannot have any uh, ind indices going out of range. <clears throat> All right. So I think basically what I'm going to have to do here is um, I want to read the numbers, that's fine. The next thing I wanna do is I wanna find the smallest number. So maybe I'll send it um, my array and num items because I'm gonna to have to know the num items because I, I don't wanna search through the whole array. I only wanna search through the part of the array that is being used, right? Um, and then I'm gonna send a parameter named smallest so that the find smallest function can uh, report back what the smallest item in the array was. And then I'm gonna have a print numbers except smallest function. Same, uh, same arguments, right? I'm gonna need the array. I'm gonna need to know how many items there are in the array. And, but I'm also gonna need to know what the smallest number in the array is so that I can skip it. So we're gonna to have to work on the find smallest function, but basically we can do the print numbers except smallest easily. Um, Okay, um, and then I'm just gonna say inside here, instead of always printing this, I'm just gonna say, I'm only gonna print it if it's not the smallest. So if my array sub count is not equal to smallest, print it. Okay, 
So what's left is I need to write the find smallest function. Any questions at this point? Please feel free, not gonna do us any good if I just keep plowing ahead, if this doesn't make sense so far. So what if you had a tie for the smallest number? Or in other words, what if I had two occurrences of the smallest number? Yes. Um, well, what's gonna happen is I'm gonna skip both of them, right? That makes sense? Yeah. So the, the find smallest number will return that value as being the smallest number in the array. And then when I print it out, this if statement just makes it so that I print all occurrences of that number. Okay. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna plow ahead here. Um, and by the way, this is one of those programs where I'm, I'm doing it in sort of a natural way at first. And then I'm hoping that we have time to go back and refine it because we can make it a lot better just to kind of give you a sneak preview. But um, here's my find smallest, I've got int. So I'm not changing the array, so I'm gonna have const int my array, right? Um, I'm not changing num items, so it's gonna be just passed by value on num items. But I am going to be changing smallest, or in other words, this function I'm writing now is going to be sending that information back to the calling function, which was main. So I'm going to say int ampersand smallest. Okay, uh, so here's how this is going to work. We're just going to have a variable that um, keeps track of what the smallest number we've seen so far is. I'm gonna call it small. And then, uh, and I'm gonna start off by assuming that the first item in the array is the smallest item. Everyone okay with that? So then I'm gonna go through every element in the rest of the array, or all, at least the part of the array that we're using. And I'm gonna say, okay, if the number I'm looking at is less than the smallest number I've seen so far, then this number I'm looking at is now the smallest number I've seen so far, All right? That was a fairly convoluted English sentence, but I'm gonna translate it into C++ now. If the number I'm looking at, oh, uh, well, first thing to loop, right? Start at one, because I already am assuming that Array sub zero is the smallest. Um, and by the way, I'm a little bit inconsistent here. Sometimes I use I, sometimes I use count. The reason for that is that in real life, I would use I. Uh, when I'm first teaching for loops at the very start, I use count, but you're gonna see me sort of gradually transition to using I instead. Um, all right. so. For each number that I'm looking at, I'm gonna say if the number I'm looking at, my array sub i, is less than the smallest number I've seen so far, then that means that the smallest number I've seen so far is that number that I'm looking at. Okay? So when I finish this for loop, the smallest number in the array will be in the variable small. And so I will say return small. Not return, cheese, what am I doing? Uh, I'm done, right? Because, uh, except I need to make this small instead of smallest. And it looks like I need to update my prototypes also. Read numbers, no change. Find smallest. Print numbers, except smallest. Line number 16. Uh, hold on, give me a sec. Fifteen. Sixteen. 
Um, did you still have a question? No question? No, no. Okay. Um, all right, so I actually think, well, let me put it this way. As far as I know, this will work as we have it. Uh, there's a lot going on here, so uh, I always expect that there's probably gonna be a syntax error or two, but let's give it a try. Uh, smallest is, and, uh, yeah. and then I have a redefinition of small. Right, I don't need to declare it here because I already declared it in the parameter list. Uh, let's just try this again. There we go. So now if I do four, five, six, one, two, three, the output is four, five, six, two, three. Okay. And I noticed I never had to enter a negative number because I kept going until the array was full. All right. I wanna talk about just a couple of ways that we can improve on this code now. The first one is, this is one of those cases where find smallest is gonna work a lot better if we make it a value returning function, okay? And one way to see this is, and, and so what I'm about to say is just sort of my attempt to help you think about when to use a value returning function instead of a void function. Um, there's no input or output going on inside this function. And this function is sending exactly one piece of information back to the calling function. That's the situation where you should definitely use a value returning function instead of a void function. There are some, there are some times when there's some gray area where different programmers might do things differently. But in this case, there's no input or output going on inside the function and it's, sending exactly one piece of information back to the calling function, that should be a value returning function. So uh, what we can do here is I'll say smallest gets, and then I can take it out of the parameter list and then take it out of the parameter list. Sorry, I said parameter list a second ago. I should have said argument list. Um, and then I just have to return small at the bottom. Any, oh, and then make this int, right? And then update my prototypes. Okay, I realize I just did a ton of stuff right there. Anybody wanna ask a question or need me to just slow down or talk about something again. I basically just converted find smallest from a void function to an int function, which makes, uh, it, it, it's, I think it simplifies the code in main a, a teeny bit because now I don't need this third argument here in find smallest, um, but it's gonna get even better. I just wanna stop there for a second and make sure no one has any questions. Okay, so it turns out we can actually do better than this because all I'm doing here is I'm saying smallest gets the function call and then I'm putting smallest here. We can be more succinct by just simply putting this function call right here in the argument list. Same thing. Who wants me to do that again? Anybody want to, meet, want to see that again or have a question about what I just did? Okay. Um, you're going to see this in the lesson. And I think in the lesson, I make a big, I, I say pretty strongly, oh, you should always do this whenever you can. Um, that's probably overstating it a little bit. There certainly could be some cases where it could make your code clearer if you make the function call first, maybe assign it to the, a variable name that's very descriptive and then put that variable name in here. But in this case, we're gonna go with um, putting the function call right here in the argument list 
Um, the only reason I just said what I did is that, so that when you see that in the lesson, you'll know to not take it quite as seriously as it sounds. Um, and I need to I need to edit that. I don't think I have yet. Um, anyway, any questions so far? So now this I think uh, is even better because I uh, got rid of an entire line of code. I got rid of a, an entire variable. So I actually got rid of two lines of code. Um, and then I'm going to take it a step further even, and I'm going to say, really what this function here is doing, I I'm going to generalize this function, right? I have, I have named it print numbers except smallest, but really all this function does is it prints all of the numbers except for whatever this third parameter is, right? So if I make this more, if I use more general language, then this is a function that might, I might be able to reuse again some other time. So I'm just gonna call it print list except. And then this is gonna be called number to skip. Everyone understand what I just did? Very minor change, right? All I did was change a couple of, uh, change the name of the function and change the name of one parameter. But now this is a function that I can use anytime I ever need to have a function that prints all of the numbers from an array except for one particular number, okay? That may not sound all that exciting, uh, but the general principle I, I hope is there. Generalizing the function so it's e easier to reuse at a later time. Um, okay, did I change any prototypes here? I don't think I did. So we try this one last time. I realize I'm over by a couple minutes, but I'm almost done. Or at least I thought it was 39. Oh, so I just need to declare small now. I think that's it. Oh, uh, it looks like a prototype is wrong. Oh, I forgot to take out the word smallest for my prototype. Oh, and for my function call. So you guys are supposed to be watching out for me here, letting me know when I do dumb stuff like that. There we go. So four, five, six, one, two, three. There's the numbers except for this next. Okay. So I realized I actually ended up going a little bit fast at the end there. Um, so, you know, if you go and you look at this in the lesson and there's something you can't figure out, please feel free to email me with a question. Um, any last minute questions before we, before we leave? Okay, so um, have fun in lab. Uh, assignment four, I'm just gonna put it out there that um, for many students, this turns out to be the hardest assignment of the semester. So not telling you that to scare you, just uh, giving you a little heads up to give yourself plenty of time and to not get too discouraged if you're finding it difficult. Um, but it's sort of like our, our last round of review. And so it, it's going to be a, a challenge. Um, how does the lab naming work? You know, I think I'm going to go ahead and let you ask your lab instructor about that, if that's okay. Um, and don't worry too much about it. We're not going to like, you know, fail you because you named the, the thing wrong. Um, Okay, so any anything else we need to talk about before um, before we go? All right, um, I'll see you Monday and have fun in lab. Thank you. Have a good day.